Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of, of the global main stage of Campus Party Digital Edition. Today, I'm going to introduce you. I'm Giacomo, I'm the Global Content Manager of Campus Party. Today, I'm going to introduce you the first panel of the day that is um, between Alejandro Agag, the president of Formula E, and Lucas Di Grassi, that is a Brazilian racing driver that competes in the Formula E and that has won the uh, competition in tw the season 2016-2017. Uh, will, they will talk about how the, the suspension of the Formula E has affected the business and also how the, the, the Formula E is, a, is actually an electric vehicles competition, so how that is affecting the the long run in the in the competition of motorsports and also how is formula e finishing its, its competition its seasons all of these questions that will be highlighting here um, in the comments and i do not wait any more time and i will introduce now alejandro agag well, good Welcome. morning good morning everyone uh, it's great to be here with you guys at the nl campus party and, um, you know, to speak about the effects of, obviously, of the pandemic, uh, the effects uh, that is happening in Formula E, um, and the effect is having all over the world. And um, I think I thought that maybe it was useful to uh, reflect a bit before we go on the specifics of Formula E and what's going on. And also, Luca Di Grassi will be joining us later, uh, Formula E champion, and uh, also a very knowledgeable person in technology questions and in environmental questions. Um, he can comment on that, too. But I thought to really make a bit of a comment on uh, uh, what's the effect that we are seeing uh, of the pandemic uh, in uh, global emissions. How is that affecting uh, the, the, the level of global emissions? And what lessons can we learn from that uh, that we can apply for the future? And um, hi, Lucas. I see you there in the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Alejandro. Hi. How are you doing? You're in Brazil, right? No, no, no. I'm in Monaco. Hi, you're in Monaco. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were jogging there the other day yeah. um so what i was saying is that you know we have been hit by an unprecedented event uh nobody was waiting for this uh, kind of a black swan event that has affected basically the world economy the world societies um and uh, this shows us how a an event of this kind can paralyze the world but this pandemic, it's a, it's, a, it's a kid's game compared to the effect that global uh, warming, especially climate change, can have in the global economies. The problem of climate change is that it's uh, practically, practically irreversible in the medium-short term uh, when it, once it happens. The pandemic is hopefully reversible, and we are seeing how some of our countries have already put the pandemic under control. Hopefully we will have a vaccine or a treatment soon. So that will mitigate the pandemic. So you're seeing an effect that is going to last one or two years. Climate change may last for centuries. And uh, we have another element to take into account. We didn't know that a pandemic was coming. We do know that climate change uh, is coming. Um, and it's humanly induced. Basically, there is a scientifically proven um, greenhouse effect that means that the more CO2 we, uh, and the greenhouse, other greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere, the higher the temperature of the atmosphere goes. And um, that's what the humans are doing at the moment. So we're warming uh, our planet up. Um, the bit uh, of, there is a bit of a lesson here uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. Even if you think of the huge stop that we have imposed into the global economy, the emissions have not been reduced that much. There are different figures from different institutions, but the consensus is that we've seen a reduction between 6 and 10 percent of uh, CO2 emissions around the world. And this is with no, almost no planes flying, with cars not going on the streets, and so on and so forth. So even if we were to do what we are doing now all the time, we would not reduce significantly the emissions to the atmosphere. And we would continue to emit a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. What this shows us is that technology is going to have to play a role here. We are going to have to um, develop carbon capturing technologies that take out, not only stop emitting, but take out uh, CO2 and other greenhouse uh, gases from the atmosphere and capture it and put it where it belongs, maybe 
under the under the surface of the planet. So I think that's that's kind of really the big lesson uh, that the pandemic is showing. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot to do. And 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 really, this is a huge uh, again uh, alert uh, sign that we need to listen to. I don't know, Lucas, what you think about uh, about this. Um, thanks, Alejandro. Um, of course, um, you you are one of the greatest um, entrepreneurs of uh, our time in terms of uh, trying to change this mentality of uh, bringing new technologies uh, into play uh, through Formae now through Extreme, and um, it's it's just a, a little help. But I think if every industry would accelerate in the same way the adoption of renewable technologies. We could accomplish exactly what you said much sooner. Um, if you look at the numbers, um, transportation uh, in cars especially only counts for 12 percent of the greenhouse emissions. So we need to be tackled in many different areas. So from um, production, uh, waste management, um, to transport in general, to uh, production, no um, uh, It has to have. We have to have an holistic approach on top of uh, capturing carbon, regardless if it's planting trees. There has been some calculations saying we need one trillion trees uh, to combat um, or to 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 to, de or to slow down climate change. So we need to capture carbon. We need to change our technologies. But this will be very hard to achieve without innovation and without new technologies, because developing countries, uh, developed countries, are the ones emitting most of the carbon, like US and China. But developing countries, um, they cannot afford so much of this technology. So it's it's very important that the technology goes hand in hand with with costs. People, we've seen that many times. People will not just by their own perception and by their own um, or to try to mitigate carbon by decreasing their quality of life. People will try to replace if there is a technology that could replace it in a nice way and cheaper and better and safer and so on. They would do it. But they will not do it for free will, especially um, people in, in developing countries. I'm from Brazil, so I know um, what I'm talking about. Um, and so that's why it's important, for example, for electric cars, which is exactly the, 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 the purpose of Forma E. Electric cars need to start mass production. So mass production, you can get a cheaper production cost, which makes it a um, lower price, so people have uh, can afford the operation cost of an electric car is much cheaper and the circle starts to turn and we start to, to go into that direction. So, yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but um, we have to do it. We, there is no, uh, at the moment, there is no uh, B plan. There is no B planet. So we need, we need, we need to do it um, uh, for us and for our children. I think, I mean, I think Lucas is touching a point that is uh, extremely important, which is the economic case of, uh, of uh, the fight against climate change. Um, this cannot be done and will not happen if uh, it has to be done at a huge sacrifice from the living standard of the people. The people will basically not, not accept it. And uh, we've seen it, uh, I'm currently in France, in Paris. We've seen it here in France. Uh, the government tried to put a tax, uh, an eco tax, a tax on the diesel uh, fuel and uh, you know it was not a huge tax but it was some tax and it almost uh, changed a revolution people didn't want to accept it people don't care about the effect on climate change because they don't see it as an immediate effect they say that okay it's going to happen sometime in the future but tomorrow I need to put the fuel on my car so don't tax it so we need to really figure out and again we go to the case of the technology um, ways to innovate that make compatible, keep a certain level of uh, living standards for the general population, make it that compatible with the fight against uh, against climate change. I think that's I think that's the only way that is going to happen. Um, and like I say, I think there is already a change going on. So the younger generations are more uh, you know aware of what's going on and more ready to make certain sacrifices, but but not huge sacrifices. I don't detect really the widespread uh, will to sacrifice your style of life and you know even the activists that are really fighting and you know want to change the system not really is not really clear to what other system 
uh, but they say that the system is not working and we have to destroy the system, which I obviously disagree with. No one is really proposing any other system. They are, they, there is no other solution. So we have, we're going to have to work with the cards we, we have and we're going to have to find a way where we can make this happen compatible with the general living standard of, of, uh, of everybody. Luca starts into electric cars, and I think it's a good moment to, to speak maybe a little bit about, uh, about Formula E and what we do in Formula E and the effect of the pandemic in Formula E. And Lucas can elaborate on what's going on with his team because he's going to have to do six races in a period of nine days, which I think that uh, no drivers, no race drivers have ever done before. So many races in so many, in so short period of time. But just to give you the picture, when we uh, when COVID uh, hit, when the crisis started to, to have an effect of lockdown all over the world, uh, Formula E have had already five of its races of the season. So we were already almost halfway through the championship. We then had to cancel all the other events. And we have compressed everything, the rest of the season, in six races on the same city, in Berlin. So we will be traveling to Berlin at the beginning of uh, August to race there, uh, and it's going to be very challenging because the drivers will have to do a race on Thursday, or I think it's on Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday. So six races in nine days. So uh, I would like to know Lucas' opinion on how you know, how he sees that challenge uh, and uh, how can things play out on, on a championship that is so different. Um, that's true. It's going to be a huge challenge. So uh, for us, we are, like you said, halfway through the championship. So everything is open. The difference between, I guess, even if you haven't scored a single point in Formula E, in Formula e at the moment, theoretically, you still can win the championship in Berlin if you win the, 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 the six races. And to be honest, in Formula E, anything can happen. So uh, we are preparing right now. Um, this month has, will be, has been and will be of intense preparation for Berlin. You need to arrive there physically fit, mentally fit, the teams, the mechanics, everybody needs to be um, aware that going to be uh, a very intense, very, a lot of pressure for 10 days, and that will define the championship. And um, to be honest, it's not the ideal solution, uh, because of course we want to race in Rome, we want to race everywhere that we used to race, but given the COVID uh, situation, I think it's the, it's the optimum uh, solution for now. Uh, which is to, to, to finish this championship, to uh, at least do the 11 races, which were scheduled before, and um, go through this, this, uh, this phase, and then start the next championship, um, in a, which is the first time that it's going to be the world championship. So it's a very important season, uh, season seven. It starts the next championship in a good, uh, in a good way. So I think COVID especially had a, a, a big effect, not in Formula E. Formula E, I think it was the least affected, but in motorsport in general, a lot of automakers going bankrupt, getting loan, um, merging or with uh, debt or finance problems. And this will have a big impact again in motorsport for the years to come. So um, uh, if you sum that with uh, being mobility used as a, so in, instead of, buying cars you're using mobility as a service plus automation plus electrification so this whole change that is going on in our industry um motorsport will have to adapt will have to change very quickly um to um like many industries will have to change very quickly and we have to adapt to cut costs to increase efficiencies if we want to continue if we want to survive um and uh, evolve in a post-pandemic world um I was uh, I had dinner last night with uh, with John Todd, with the president of the FIA of the Federation, and we were discussing of uh, when this COVID situation is going to end. And uh, you know, even if uh, in Europe, for example, you're able now to go from London to Paris, and you can go to Italy and to Spain, and situation looks a little bit more under control. We are seeing that the figures are look out of control in many places. They definitely look out of control in the US. Brazil. They look out of control in many countries in Latin America. They look out of control of growing a lot in India. And the new one, maybe we just have to learn to live with this. Uh, and it's not going to go away. Um, so that's a big uh, question mark. We we don't have the answer yet, obviously. But things, uh, unfortunately, don't look very good. So the, the, the big question mark is, what's going to happen next year? Are we going to have, again, a situation in which next year we need to continue without having expectators? or we can slowly go back and introduce spectators into the races. 
Um, maybe it's also a good moment to mention uh, Extreme E. Extreme E is a new sport that we are launching next year. Which and I, it's a sport that as a concept has is the best, is the best time in ever for the... No spectators. Extreme yeah. E has no spectators. in the coastlines in Africa and it's it's a sport that is only for media for television and no spectators so it happens to be ideal in this uh, let's say public world uh, we don't want it to be ideal because we don't want the public world but it may just happen to, to have arrived uh, at the at the right time um, and again it's another uh, way for motorsport to promote uh, and to uh, push you know the technology that can be useful to fight uh, climate change. Uh, Andrew, your audio is a, is a bit low. Uh, if yeah. you can change your. So, for people who doesn't know, Extreme E is a completely new electric championship that, after Formula E has created, introduced for the first time ever electric technology into motorsport. Extreme E will take this technology to the extremes. So, ex uh, what does it mean? You're gonna take an off-road car, gonna put this car in very cold conditions, very high, in near salt water, in sand, everywhere to see and to develop the technology that the battery and the powertrain needs to adapt and need to, to be able to, to go through these environments if you want every single car in the world to be electric. So Extreme is the next step towards um, electrification. And as Alejandro was, uh, was mentioning, we're gonna go to extreme places, uh, glaciers, desert, island, um, jungle, yeah. where else? Uh, and the coastline, the ocean. Ocean, and um, we're gonna test the, the limits of the electric powertrain of different cars and, and uh, with the different race format. Actually, very interesting. If you're look, if you're watching us, just go uh, Extreme E Live. Uh, just Google it. You see the website. You see all the videos. You look, it, it is the car is the car is has, it's actually extreme. I have to say that. And um, I, myself, as a racing driver, I'm really looking forward because, again, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you have no spectators. It's a championship which is a, a solely developed as a product for for the development of technology and entertainment. So I think the timing of Extreme E would be is actually very good, right, Alejandro? I think so. I think it's coming at the right time. Uh, I think the world will be really positive for the it's going to be different. I think that after the pandemic, people are going to focus a lot more into purpose, into, into being associated, being pushing projects that have a goal that is to make the world better in any way, different ways. And definitely, Extreme really, really goes in that direction. Extreme has also a legacy program. So everywhere we go, first we have this team of scientists that check that we don't damage any areas of the ones where we go. Second, we have this also team of scientists that do legacy programs. So, for example, in Senegal, we're gonna we're gonna plant one million mangroves. In the Amazon, we're gonna reforest hundreds of hectares of uh, rainforest, and so on and so forth. We have all these projects. For example, we're gonna clean up all the, the areas of the coast of Africa that are full of plastic in the beach, and so on and so forth. No? So, and I think that in the future, people will want to be more and more focusing on projects that make some kind of sense, have some kind of purpose. And that is, uh, that is the reason why I think Extreme is coming really uh, at, the right, uh, at the right time. But you know, we are in a very changing world, so we will see, we will see what, uh, what the future uh, brings. But, but you know, we are, we are really, even in the current situation, you have to be optimistic. We're really looking forward to next year and to start a new project, even in the COVID time. Yes, um, I I fully I fully agree, and uh, it's a really um, a very interesting project. And um, I, me, and I think every every racing driver wish the best for Extreme E and uh, for its start season uh, next season. So wh when is the when is it the first race? First race is going to be in March. Now we are tweaking the calendar, but the first race will be in March. We will make the announcement of the calendar. I think in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, we had a couple of delays linked to COVID, but nothing really bad. A couple of months because uh, we have a ship for Extreme E, the Santa Elena. The ship is in the shipyard. And the shipyard was closed in the UK for a couple of months. But um, but apart from that, if there are no more lockdowns or uh, things like that, 
uh, we will be we will be ready to go very soon. Very very good. Yeah 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 yeah. And when when actually when I'm gonna be able to drive the Extreme E car? I've been talking to Ali all the time, and there was never. Yes, I know. So we we are we are now um, finalizing the test on the prototypes, and we will have all the cars ready for a test. I think end of August or September. So we're just now uh, looking. We, I think we burned two inverters in the last test. I think we pushed a little bit too much. So we're waiting for the new inverters to come, and that those will be the inverters already for the race cars. So they're all coming now uh, on the production line, and we will have uh, this testing in the end of August or September. So you will be able to race it. I have driven the car, and it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I remember I was super impressed when I walked, when I saw it first time in Goodwood. Actually, the Goodwood Festival yeah. speed last year. And uh, I think it was the launch of the car there, and the car looked uh, it, it, for, a, for it looked big, it looked mean, it looked yeah, yeah, yeah. The car is a beast. And I saw the car uh, going up the hill there in Gudu, and was uh, just amazing. So I think it's the a beast. Is really the car is a beast. Yeah. Sorry, Alejandro, we cannot hear you. You cannot hear me. No, no, yes. No, the 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 the, the audio is come is going up and down. Oh uh, really? Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm getting closer yeah. to the screen. Can you hear me or no? Yeah, yeah. Oh now you can. No, I was wondering because I got a message that we may have a question now from the moderator. Yes. Hello. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, how are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, I have a question. For you, Alejandro, is sure. what is your best idea to reboot the planet? If you can say one thing to all humankind, way well, guys do this together to help the planet, what can be? It's difficult. Oh, I, I know, wish, but I wish, uh, I, I wish I had one single idea to tell the world to, to reboot the planet. But uh, I have one. Tell change me yours. To electric, change to electric cars now. Have a, a program, a machine learning program. Listen us and proceed, processing everything to extract the best ideas. And your idea is going down to the system. And let's see. Good. Let's <laughs> Thank see. Thank you, Alejandro. Good. Ciao. Pleasure to be with you guys. Please. Thank you. Um, okay, Lucas. So that's uh, I think it from my side. Yes, um, that, that's actually um, it was a very good conversation. I think there is a lot of things that uh, it, it could be done, especially if we put the right pressure in our governments. Um, I am when he said he was saying about one idea to change how it uh, how the future could go. Um, I would go to start taxing, like you said, with friends. So tax fossil fuels and redistributing this tax directly as a basic income for the poorer people. Because this will have a, um, a direct effect on the on the people supporting it, because they would get money out of it, and you would pay more tax when you consume more of or you produce more CO2 in a general term. So it could have a good effect. There is even a TED talk about it, which is definitely definitely carbon carbon has to be taxed and, and polluting has to be taxed, and that money can be used then to help uh, people who are not polluting and uh, and yeah, yeah, okay. the lower, okay. let's say. Okay. 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 Because if you think about it, one average American produces almost 20 times uh, more CO2 than the average African. So it's unfair 
to not let Africa develop because of such a, a rule when the US and China has been polluting for now a century. So anyway, the, there is a lot of things to be done. We have to plant trees. We have to each one of us uh, do our own uh, to live by the word we say. So try to improve in every area that we work, in every business that you are, independently if it's energy, racing, um, any kind of industry, uh, production of goods whatsoever. Everyone doing a small step towards a better future will definitely have a big impact. And we need to act quickly. We need to put pressure in our governments. We need to elect uh, people that uh, have the right mindset and need to make the world a better place. Otherwise, like you said, the pandemic will look like a, a small wave. I like that you posted the other day uh, on your on your yeah the waves the waves and there is like the COVID then there is the recession wave and then there is the climate change wave on the back and it's exactly that if we don't act now. Um, we saw how much the COVID can change the world's GDP. Climate change could have a devastating impact on our uh, well-being as, as a humans in the, in the planet in the longer term. And that's something that we don't want to do it for our sons and grandsons. Yeah. No children. Absolutely. Anyway, so like the uh, screen says, reboot the world. Yeah, let's do it. Good. Good to see you, Lucas. Good to see you guys. Take care. We'll speak soon. Thank you, Campus Party.